My name is Sam Fonestock. I'm the discipleship pastor here at New Life. If you are new here, we have prayed and prepared for you, and we're so thankful that you were able to join us. And for everyone here, I am so thankful that you've decided to join us for worship today. Today, we are concluding our mini-series we called Tune My Heart, where we dived into the message behind some of the worship songs we sing. Worship is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, so I'm very excited to be able to share this message with you. Growing up, music was something I always enjoyed. My immediate family was not the most musically talented, but we definitely loved listening to music. And so, in fact, my favorite childhood music memory has nothing at all to do with playing or singing music. Back when surround systems were becoming popular and they were coming out with 5.1 and 7.1 surround, my dad decided we needed a system. So he went to the store, he got this big fancy system that the serviceman told him he really needed, brought it home and I set it up. Now to test it, most people would probably have put in an action movie and cranked it up to see what it sounded like. But not my dad. When he bought the system, he also bought a DVD of the Eagles in concert. <laughs> now, one of the selling points of this DVD was that one of the tracks, Seven Bridges Road, had a different voice in each speaker. So what was cool is you could walk around the room and hear a different person singing in each speaker. Now, what was really cool about this was when you went to the center of the room, you heard a beautiful harmony. You heard what the Eagles wrote the song to sound like. Now, if one of the speakers wasn't working correctly, you would still hear some harmony, but not a full harmony. What was really nice is it actually turned out to be a great way to test out the system. But if one of those speakers wasn't working, you didn't hear that full harmony the way the Eagles wrote the song to sound. God created us that same way. God created us. He gave us different disciplines, things we do to draw closer to him, that all work together to create a beautiful harmony in our walk with him. And worship is one of those disciplines. Now, that might be exciting for some of you because worship is something you enjoy. It's something you participate in easily. But for some of you, like Pastor Barry likes to say, it might be your broccoli. You know it's good for you. You know you need it, but it's not the first thing you reach for on your plate. Now, whether worship is your go-to connection with God or it's your broccoli, it is a powerful weapon we wield. A few weeks ago in our series on the power we have through the Holy Spirit, Pastor Alex gave us one reason why worship is so important to us. Worship gets us ready to join God in his work because it humbles us before God. Worship reminds us of how big our God is. Worship reminds us of how desperately we need him. And that brings us to our take-home point today as we dive through the song East to West by River Valley Worship. Our take-home point is the one point this whole message focuses on. Only Jesus Christ can set us free from sin. Now we're going to dive into a number of phrases and lyrics from the song today, but we're going to start by looking at the passage the song was based on, Psalm 103. Before we dive into that, though, let's pray. God, I thank you for this opportunity you've given us to, to dive in and understand your message through this song. God, I thank you that you laid this song upon the hearts of the people who wrote it. I thank you that you've given us the opportunity to worship you through it. God, fill this place with your Holy Spirit this morning. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and speak to us the way you need to speak. Let us hear the words we need to hear. And God, let us leave this place with a, a renewed awe in you of how much you love us and all that you've done for us and are doing for us. God, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. 
And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 So Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12 says this. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions for us. What a beautiful picture of God's love for us. God doesn't give us the punishment we deserve. Through Jesus Christ, God sets our sins infinitely far away from us. Now, as we dive into this passage and the song, a great place to look first is these wrongs, these things that God casts away from us. The first line of the song says, I remember that prison cell that held me in my sin and guilt. This line runs completely countercultural. It goes against everything the world believes about God and Christianity. The line says it's our sins, our wrongs, which hold us captive, which enslave us. But the world believes it's God who enslaves us. It's God's rules. It's the Bible's rules which enslave us because they don't allow us to do whatever we want. In the world's eyes, We don't have real freedom. Real freedom. Real freedom is the key, and it's why the world believes Jesus' followers are slaves. In the eyes of the world, real freedom means I get to choose to do whatever I want with no one telling me what I can or cannot do. I am free because I can marry whomever I want, no matter what gender they are. I am free because I can be whatever gender I want, no matter what I was born as. I am free because I can climb the ladder in my career however I want, no matter who I step on to get there. In the eyes of the world, that is real freedom. But that's not real freedom. Underneath those examples and ultimately underneath the things we do each day are our desires. We desire that person. We desire that promotion. We desire that ice cream or that great big Italian hoagie. And if we were honest with ourselves, if we could look under the hood and see what was truly going on, we would see that it's those desires which ultimately control us. It's those desires that enslave us. Hi, my name is Sam, and I am a slave to ice cream. (laughs) Now, I know this seems silly, but bear with me for a moment. I am a slave to ice cream. I'm not a big sweets or dessert person. In fact, I would choose that great big Italian hoagie nine times out of ten, but not when ice cream is involved. So earlier this year, I decided to start a diet to get healthier, and it's going well. I'm finding ways to eat healthy that still taste pretty good. Then about a month ago, I was recovering from knee surgery, and as a treat, Brittany, my wife, bought me some ice cream. Now, I wasn't exercising or mobile at the time, so I decided I was going to enjoy the treat, but slowly, in small quantities over a long period of time. And then two days later, the entire gallon of ice cream was gone. (laughs) Then last weekend, my family and I went to our cottage out in the mountains, and nearby there is an ice cream store who's famous for the size of their ice cream cones. So we had to stop. Now, if the picture that you're about to see doesn't say this man is a slave to ice cream, (laughs) I don't know what does. And yes, I did finish the entire cone. (laughs) I am a slave to my desire for ice cream. My mind told me I wanted to eat this over a long period of time so that it was healthier for my body. Yet my slavery to my desire for ice cream had me finish that entire gallon of ice cream in two days. Now, 
Slavery to our desires goes far beyond our food. Our desires have so much more power over us than we realize. We are slaves to so many other things. I am a slave to so many other things. I was raised with the Western PA work ethic. I was taught to work hard at everything I did. That's a great thing. But it's also fostered in me a slavery to arrogance. I worked hard at that thing. I deserve it. I worked hard for those degrees. You should really listen to me because I'm actually smarter than you. (laughs) I've worked hard at that thing for 20 years. You should do what I say because I know more than you. I don't want to think these things. In fact, I often pray and ask God to fill me with the Holy Spirit to overcome these thoughts, but I still think them at times. That is slavery to my thoughts and desires. So what are you a slave to? Are you a slave to ice cream? Are you a slave to arrogance, to lust, to alcohol? I have some good news. We're not alone in this slavery. In the book of Romans, Paul told us this. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong... This shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living inside me that does it. Paul described here that we are slaves to our sin, to those desires inside us. And that's why the world's definition of freedom is so wrong. They believe freedom is when we get to do whatever we desire But what they either don't understand or don't acknowledge is that it's those desires that ultimately control us. It's those desires that ultimately enslave us. Paul, the author of two-thirds of our New Testament and arguably the most influential Christian of all time outside of Jesus Christ, just told us that he did things he didn't want to do. He just told us that he was a slave to his sin, and that we are as well. So us regular people have no hope, right? No. Praise God, no, because we have a God who loves us unconditionally. The song puts it like this, shame said no, but your grace said yes. Chains said no, but your love said yes said yes. Thank God for his love. That shame we feel because of our sins is broken by God's amazing grace. Those chains of slavery we are under to those desires are overcome by God's unending love. Because you see, God isn't fair. Remember verse 10 from Psalm 103? He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. God doesn't give us what we deserve. Fairness says when I do something wrong, I must pay the penalty for it. Fairness says when I eat an entire gallon of ice cream, I should get a stomach ache. Fairness says when I speak down to somebody because they don't have the degrees I do, they should be able to reciprocate and speak rudely to me. Fairness says when I sin, the penalty must be death. So praise God he isn't fair. In the book, The Christian Atheist, Craig Rochelle puts it like this. If the wages of sin is death and we're sinners, then we deserve death. We've broken the law. We're guilty. We deserve to be punished. 
to die and suffer eternally would be fair punishment for our disobedience. But thank God he's not fair. In his mercy, God sent his son Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. If we know Jesus, he doesn't give us what we deserve. Through Jesus, God made a way for us. Through Jesus, God casts our sins away from us infinitely far. Paul closed out that passage in Romans like this. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. This beautiful picture of Jesus freeing us from that slavery to sin is what David was looking forward to, what David was foreshadowing in Psalm 103. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Through Jesus, our sins are cast as far away as the east is from the west. That phrase, the east is from the west, reflects an ancient understanding of geography. In our modern world, this could mean different things to different people because we see the world as round. So I did a few distance calculations for us to help us understand. So from the furthest point in eastern PA to the furthest point in western PA is 352 miles, or about a six-hour drive. Okay, from the furthest point east in the U.S. to the furthest point west in the U.S. is 3,592 miles, or about a 54-hour drive. Okay? Now, if you're looking at a map, the furthest point east, which would be eastern Russia, to the furthest point west, which would be western Alaska, is 24,839 miles, or 62 miles if you just go the other direction. (laughs) So because of our modern understanding of the world, the phrase east to west can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We could also look at it as a nice metaphor, just meaning really far away. But the ancient understanding of this phrase is so much more powerful. You see, in David's time, people believed the earth was flat. And so this term, east to west, was not a relative term. It meant the opposite ends of the world. So for ancient readers, east to west meant as far apart as it was possible to be. So David was saying that God will take our sins as far away from us as possible. That's amazing news. But here's the hard part for me. If David told us that God will remove our sins as far away from us as possible, And Paul told us that it's through Jesus Christ our sins are removed. Then why did Paul also tell us that he still did things he didn't want to do? Why did Paul, super Christian, say that he was still a slave to his sin? And why are we? The answer is, is because of the spiritual battle waging all around us and the spiritual battle constantly being waged inside us while we live this life. When you look at the whole Bible, it is clear that Jesus Christ will free us from our sins. When we leave this life and we spend eternity with him, we will no longer struggle with slavery to those desires, slavery to our sins. But while we live this life, we are in a constant battle between our old nature and our new nature. Our old nature 
is that carnal or fleshly person inside us which only seeks to serve itself. We may do a good job of hiding it or fighting against it at times, but it's always there. Uh, Watchman Nee, a Christian pastor and author, said, it's like that old man is unemployed but constantly looking for work. Paul, in that same passage in Romans, put it like this. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. When we accept that beautiful gift of mercy from God through Jesus Christ, we are given our new nature. That new nature is the Holy Spirit living inside us. God, creator of the universe, living inside us as guide, as helper, as aid. That's amazing news. We have so much power through the Holy Spirit. We just spent nine weeks talking about the power we have through the Holy Spirit living in us. But the one thing the Holy Spirit doesn't do is remove the old nature from us while we live this life. We battle constantly between that old nature, those sinful desires inside us, and our new nature, the Holy Spirit living inside us, giving us true, real freedom. Paul made it clear, while we live this life, We will constantly battle between our old nature and new nature. But ultimate freedom from those desires, from the things we don't want to do but still do, comes through Jesus Christ. And while that battle is constantly raging, it's not a hopeless situation. When we look at the life of Paul, we see a man so convicted, he endured pain and suffering simply to share the love of Jesus with the world. We see a man who constantly fought the battle with his old nature so he could teach and disciple others. We can fight that battle through this week's next step. This week, I will identify one sin I'm enslaved to and lay it at the feet of Jesus each day. This will mean different things to different people. For some of us, this might mean laying our sins down and asking the Holy Spirit for power to overcome them. For others, this might mean acknowledging that you truly are a slave to your desires, that you don't have the power in yourself to overcome them, and you need Jesus to save you from them. Normally at this point in the service, we explain how simple it truly is to ask Jesus to save you from those sins. Today we're going to do something a little different. Here in a moment, the worship team is going to play through the song East to West. And while they play, I encourage you to pray, to worship, to meditate, to think on the message of this song to think on the scripture we read through today and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart the words he needs to say. Allow the Holy Spirit to move in you the way he needs to move. After they play, I will come back up and I will share how truly simple it is to ask Jesus to save you from these sins. So right now, if you're able, will you please stand, sit, kneel, pray, worship, meditate, think. Let the Holy Spirit move in you the way he needs to move. Hallelujah, you came looking for me, looking for me, now I'm found. That's my favorite line in this song because it reminds me that not only did God make a way for us, He is actively seeking us to set us free from our sins. If the Holy Spirit moved in your heart, 
and you want Jesus to set you free from your sins today, it truly is simple. It's as simple as A, B, C. A, we admit. We admit that we are a slave to our desires. We are a slave to our sins. And we don't have the power to overcome them ourselves. B, we believe. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came, he died, and he rose again to save us from our sins. And then C, we confess. We confess Jesus as our master, our owner, our Lord and Savior. We confess that we want, we need Jesus to save us. So in a moment here, I'm gonna pray as if this is the first time I'm asking Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. If you want to do that tonight, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me, but it's not the words that are important. It's the heart behind it. It's admitting, believing, and confessing Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you love us so unconditionally that you seek us out to save us from our sins. God, we are slaves to our sin. We do not have the power to overcome them ourselves. God, we need you. God, we believe that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die, to pay our punishment on that cross, but then to rise again and conquer death, to set our sins as far away as the East is from the West. So God, we confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. God, we want Jesus as owner of our life so we can have and live in that true, real freedom. And God, for those of us that have already prayed a prayer like that, God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Remind us each day of your love, of all that you've done for us. And let us use that to go out and be your hands and feet. Let us use that to share your love with others. God, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And it's in your precious name we pray, amen.